And so I took that skill set and I went, I had no job. And to tell you the truth, um, the things that my husband did didn't work out in Canada. So we were quite broke. We, we had very little left and we're on temporary visas. So I'm like really worrying now for the first time in my life. I'm actually really worried. And then I did something because of all these skills. Right. Skills then. Is it all about skills? But what kind of skills? Is it the ones that you attain through study? Is it the ones you attain through life challenges? It's worth considering, actually, where those skills come from. Everybody believes you've got to have these qualification skills, the ones that you've studied for hard and the ones that you've cried about and the ones that you have, you know, given up stuff for. So this next section with Gabriella is also wonderfully interesting. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Interesting. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I, I agree that lots of people have um, beliefs that they need another course, another diploma. I was like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another qualification before people will take you seriously. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is, it's very rare in business, whether you're freelancing or running your own small business, that people will turn around and say, Oh, please, can you show can, before we hire you? Can you please send all your diplomas to us? You know, mm -hmm. they are going to look at the work you've done already, ideally, and maybe some recommendations that have been written, or some case studies um, and know from how you speak to them, whether you are serious and you know what you're doing. I mean, you've proven when you were much younger, you know, when you were a teenager, you've proven that actually you, you can get away with a lot. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> you know, if we're honest and truthful about what we can and can't do, then you know, I've, I've turned business away because I knew in my heart that actually, no, I can't do that. Not only that, I don't want to do it, perhaps, mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, it's an interesting one, definitely. It's a and, and, you know, also people have a diploma and end up having a skill that has nothing to do with the diploma, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And it's not the destination. And I know it's corny to say it. It is the journey mm -hmm. that people have gone on. So... The life sk the skill, stroke life skill, comes in, you know, working through something to get at the end of it. And the experience that you have on the journey is so much more valuable than actually having the qualification at the end of it. Absolutely. But I only realized that at 40. I got to be really honest with you on Same that one. Here. Same here. I, I, I didn't realize till I was 44. Okay. It's when I had my life kind of midlife crisis at 44 when I, I then realized, oh, my God, I've got all these skills. Why am I stuck in an industry where I've been in for 28 years believing I couldn't do anything else? Mm -hmm. and, I didn't Interesting. and I didn't realize that I could do something else until I walked on hot coals, you know. <laughs> and after I walked on hot coals and didn't burn my feet, I went, I can do anything. <laughs> yep. You can. You really can. It's it's so interesting that we it's it's a leap of faith, really a leap of faith. But I have a saying to my myself that when I'm scared of something, I always say out loud, you know, just before I do it, what's the worst that can happen? Yes. Get that scenario in your head and say who cares? Mm. So out of that scenario, I will still be alive. I will laugh it off. So if that's the worst, I'll jump. And yeah. that's it. That's what I do to myself. Because when you start worrying like crazy every single day, 
um, I have noticed that if you're fearful, that fear, you attract it to you. And everything I've ever been scared of on a personal level has actually happened. So I try not to take that fear into my business part of my life because then it will happen too. Yes. Yeah. So you might as well leap, jump, done. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's continue the journey. <laughs> Okay, tell me where you want to go. So to where I am today, you were or? you were doing you were being ripped off by Microsoft, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's how they got rich. But you know what? I loved it. I have absolutely no regrets. I had a I had a child at that time too, so I could provide for her really well. I was a single mom very quickly. Uh, my my divorce didn't pan out, and. Um, I traveled, I was happy. Uh, I had a skill set that I got better and better in. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Microsoft came out with an update and an upgrade all the time. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't as glamorous as it sounds. So I worked every night. When I put my daughter to bed, I would work two and a half hours. Yeah. Uh, one hour was studying, one hour was prep for the next day. Because each company that you work for is different. Each conglomerate, I wanted to give them something special. And these were the days where you had projectors with plastic slides. Oh, my that you God. Had to make. Yes. So sometimes I would sit up and the slides, you know, the ink wouldn't dry. And oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. And yeah, all kinds of little mishaps. So it doesn't sound as glamorous as you might think it is, but I loved what I did. Mm. And, and that's what made me happy to do it, you know, because I could work at night and I didn't have something in my head like, oh, let's be a couch potato. I just automatically went and did it. Not just because I loved it, but also because, you know, you learn something new. And each time you learn another program, you can teach even more people. Sure. Right? Sure. So you start with Windows and then Word and then Excel and then PowerPoint and then databases. And then I learned other programs that had nothing to do with with um, with Microsoft, right? So uh, that big conglomerates use like uh SAP is very, very known in Europe. And so I learned that. And so anyway, so, mm. and then just so you know, I started writing books, uh, manuals. I started writing a lot of manuals because something in my brain clicked that what I did at Olivetti, I could do on paper. Right. And then people said, no, you can't do that. That's kind of, you know, and I did, I did. And I, I'm so proud I did it because it became my go-to in companies. Not only can you hire me, but I wrote my own manuals. Amazing. And I will adapt them to your needs. So I would go to a company and sit at a computer and take screenshots of everything and then incorporate their screenshots into the book. Into the manual. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And out of that, it's really funny. I need to fast forward here. Uh, I married again and the husband to be wanted to live in North America. Uh -huh. So I moved back to North America <laughs> and um, we chose America for a while. And then we chose Canada and uh, we live in Canada and my my mom, who wasn't very technologically savvy, of course, never grew up with it. No. She didn't even know how to use her tape deck. So I, I put little stickers on it and, you know, like we did with tons of our parents. Yes. And 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 with the stickers, it kind of worked. And she is the one that put the first seed in my head because I made a tiny little manual for her, not only for her television, but for her cassette deck. And she said, I thought it was very funny. And I said, what was funny? And she said, your little manual, 
is that what you do for corporates? And I said, yes. And she said, you put those little jokes in it. And I said, yes. Hmm. And she said, but it's the joke that I liked. And she said, it's the joke I remembered. And I said, but this is what we hope, right? And she said, no, 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 but I'm trying to tell you something. And I said, okay, mom, but then tell me, you know? Mm. And, and she said, you know, you wrote exclamation mark and it was in red ink. And it said, you are pr- most probably going to do this and look at this screen and go, what the heck just happened? <laughs> That's because your fingers push two buttons instead of one first and then the other. You push them simultaneously and then it doesn't work. Yes. You need to push one after the other and then it will work. And then I wrote, you know, had the right screen. And in the case of my mom, um, of course, I didn't have screens, so I had to be more verbal to explain how her stereo system worked. And because it wasn't a computer. So she taught me that that was my strength. It was the humorous part in it that people remembered. Of course. And what what you're doing, you obviously did this naturally. Uh, and it was more subconsciously, I guess, yeah. because that was the bit that you enjoyed the most doing that because writing manuals can be a boring job, you know, interpreting these screenshots and telling people step by step what to do. But because you put the jokes in, that made it enjoyable for you to do, number one. And number two, what you did is you put hooks in, hooks into their brains, because if they remember the joke, they remember the two fingers on the button or the two buttons at the same time into, in, simultaneously instead of one after the other. Mm. Uh, and that's what you did. You were creating a... The manual was becoming a story and people were then remembering the story, which was the joke. Yeah, exactly. So I became this kind of girl that was like, yeah, I had I had work that I had to not do because there wasn't technology to create it online yet. Um, but if there had been a classroom back then online, I could have taken even more clients, but yes. I couldn't because I always traveled to the client. And so, yeah, it, it, it was quite, quite an endeavor, especially in Europe when you do a big company and then you have to go to Munich and then you have to fly to Paris and then for the same company, right? Because yes. you have to do all their offices. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun and I loved it. But when I came to, so my mom put that seed in my head about the manuals, I came to to Canada. And then I decided that I was going to write, um, um, something educational for children because children just have my passion. And, um, I decided to write it and then present it to the EU as a Dutch national. I can present a project to the EU and see if the EU gets it sponsored. Right. So I worked on that uh, for almost a year and a half. And I was able to do that because I was married and my husband worked. Mm. So that is the first and only time that I didn't officially earn money in my life. And, um, and I was really happy to do that. And, yes. But it was a failure because I didn't get the backing I wanted. And then I tried Canada to get backing in Canada. And I did some projects, but a smaller version of what I had wanted it to be. Yes. And um, so that was kind of disappointing. <laughs> well, but go on. that's life. Yes. You know, it's life. So and again, you-, you know, there's no such, I mean, you'll understand when I say this, there is no such thing as failure. No. Exactly, because it prepared me to learn how to make a proposal. I had never done that in my life. Mm. And, and it's really hard. It's almost like grant writing, right? Yes. And you, you have to really plot out 
your your online course for children. So it's it's really difficult. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about who I am yes. and my own passion more even than helping the kids, I think, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so I learned so many skill sets in that year and a half. And I learned also when I presented it, what I did wrong. And, and, that's and then back, I went, it's back to a, sorry to interrupt. It's back to, yeah. it's the journey, not the destination that, that yeah. made you grow. Yeah. Uh, but, and, but first I, I was disappointed. I got to yeah, say that. I know, I had of course. Little, I had a little sadness, but it didn't last. It was maybe an hour long. Oh, that's, you're forgiven because, to be in sadness yeah. for an hour. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but because afterwards I was so excited, like you are, you know, I was, was so excited by the skill set and my brain was instantly going, okay, but I learned this. What can I do? And so I took that skill set and I went, I had no job. And to tell you the truth, um, the things that my husband did didn't work out in Canada. So we were quite broke. We, we had very little left and we're on temporary visas. So I'm like really worrying now for the first time in my life, I'm actually really worried. And then I did something because of all these skills from my entire life, I read I always read the newspaper, but I read it differently all of a sudden. Instead of skimming the headlines, I decided to read the local uh, news. What, what was happening in the city I lived in, in Canada, that I could find work in, like a niche. Yes. And I found it. Um, all the uh, general doctors, so what we call in Holland, we would call a house doctor, right? Someone yeah. that is the general physician. GP, and we call it in the UK, yeah. GP, yeah, exactly. And I had never heard of that word here, so I was kind of trying to figure out what that all was. But yeah, a GP, I, I'm lucky. I'm just one of those kids that is not sick often, so knock on wood here. And um, it was so much fun, Michael. I went to a computer store and I bought a tower for a hundred dollars second hand, took it home, took it totally apart. <laughs> just like I had when I was that young girl with the computer, but then instead of software, I took it totally apart and rebuilt it. Uh, the first time my electricity exploded <laughs> and um, which was too bad because I lived in a building and I think my whole floor went black <laughs> and, um, uh, I wasn't brave enough to admit it was me. And, um, I just kind of hid it <laughs> and, then, and then I went back and I bought a new motherboard and I said, this thing exploded, man. And they said, did you have fun? I said, I had a blast. <laughs> and, and then the boys were all Asian. And, and I said, you know, may, may I go in the back, you know, in, in your man cave there. And I was the only girl and yeah. And I'm, I'm a girl that wears skirts and high heels. So just picture this. Yes. I have a little suit on and the, the top, you know, the, the blazer part is thrown to the ground, literally. And I have my sleeves rolled up in this little skirt and high heels and I'm with them, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, with the electricity and I'm learning about the motherboard and it's just a blast, mm. a blast. And I was the only girl. And from that day on that little Asian store, I bought, I made a deal with them because a computer, a good computer is about 400 bucks back then. And a tower, a mm. simple tower. So then I made a deal with them with a screen. If it was a flat screen, it would have been $200. Anyway, I make all these deals. I wheeled and dealed. I went back, wrote all my deals on paper. And then I went and I made a listing 
of all the GBs. And I started in my neighborhood. I, I don't have a dime, right? I mean, I can barely survive. And I have a daughter and I have a husband. I have to take care of them. Sure. And I live in a foreign country. And so there I go. And, you know, with the knowledge of Microsoft, IBM, Olivetti, all this stuff, here I am, fresh as a daisy and bold, terribly bold. And I say, you guys need me. And I have a copy. I have like 300 copies of the article. And I said, your company needs to change to computers. And you have been given by your government $1,200. I can do this for you for (laughs) $1,200. I will stay within budget. And they look at me and they think I'm crazy. So the first four offices, nada, nothing. The fifth office says you're one hell of a crazy lady. The answer is yes. I'll do it. <laughs> and and then I say, I will give you $200 discount if you give me four new doctors. So I do it for a thousand, for a loss. And he goes, you are crazy. So there we go. And I said, but I have one request. I need 500 up front. And he says, why? And I said, I need to buy the material. Are you nuts? (laughs) Do I look like I got all that material? And he goes, got it. So I go buy the computer. And which, you know, was cheaper than 500. So I now also have money to eat. (laughs) Yes. So, uh, yeah, because I I, I was smart. I was being a good entrepreneur, right? Yes. And uh, because I need to be fit and my family needs to be fit so that we can do this. And so my living room ended up having five computers in there with, in less than a week. <laughs> and I, I had the five computers just like I had the three languages with a big room with hundreds of people. I did the computers. I had them everywhere. And I would just go tick, 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 tick. And I would install all that software for them. You know, yes. not just Microsoft, but I would install the Windows. Operating I would install system. Yeah. the operating system, everything. And then I would cater it to them. Then I would make folders for the doctor, a private folder, a patient folder, a this folder. I mean, it was so organized. And then what do you think my bonus was? I made a little manual where I, I cut out a little booklet. I cut out the print screens that came from the computer, but it was my handwriting. And what I didn't realize is that everyone said, oh my God, she has blue, beautiful handwriting. And the back of the book were all the passwords. Wow. And so I went back, I handed it off, and I taught the for free. I, get, I stayed half an hour with the assistant of the doctor. And so I did this after work. So this is after six o'clock, and the doctor often came out. And this one doctor that started it all, said, I I cannot believe this. Who are you? (laughs) Most technicians dump the stuff. We have no idea what to do. Mm. And you just, I mean, this is awesome. And then he started looking at the manual and he said, what are the blank pages for? And I said, all the programs that you're going to learn because I only installed the computer. But now this was part one, part two. See, I never told them that part. Part two is you did what, what, uh, what is requested from the government, but now you have to buy the software, but they got the software for free. And I said, I didn't make a deal with you yet because I need to find out which are the most popular softwares. And there were three and I narrowed it down to two went back to the software companies in Canada and I said, you are going to teach me. And they said, no, we're not. And I said, yes, you are. Because if you don't, I will not promote it at the doctor's office. And I got it in. 
And so they I love said, it. I love it. They said, that's pretty cheeky. And I said, yeah, I'm cheeky. I'm from Europe, man. I've got to survive. Got a family. I'm a mom. And besides, I love this. You got to make a deal. Come on. And I said, the government pays this much and you earn what? Yeah, because, you know, they got paid by the government. So I said, come on. It's no skin off your nose. You already got paid. So then I did that. And then that's it. I, I had a two step and I worked for a year nonstop, day in, day out. Saturdays, Sundays, every single day. (laughs) So I have only one word to say to people. Find the solution to a problem and make sure that the problem is your passion. That's Mm. it. Mm. Mm. That's that's my advice, because. You know, I had the skill set. I was passionate about helping and teaching. I just didn't know, you know, I'm not that passionate about the machinery per se. And then I made good money. And and that little company, that Asian company, they had to hire more people because they had to build the machines because I was going too fast. Yes. I, I, I delivered four machines a day to doctors. Yeah. And and they were like, I, I was their best client. So by the time that I needed a machine for myself, I basically got the machine for free. <laughs> yes. And then, of course, doctors that now suddenly are techno savvy, what do you think they do? Oh, could you come to my home, Gabriela? Because I have teenage children, just like I did. Yeah. Of course. Would you like me to teach your children how to do their homework in PowerPoint and do do a presentation? Oh, my God, would you? Yes. <laughs> there you go. Well, what do you ask per hour? Because I can't afford what you ask at, at you know, at, at the office. And I said, how about half? Yeah, that's decent. And there we go. An hour passes really fast. So wow. I, earned, I earned money that I needed to earn. And then I started, then there was nothing to do after the year and a half. So I learned a new skill and I started making websites because I had learned through meeting all these people that there were freelancers and entrepreneurs who wanted a website. And I went, I can write, I'll write the content and make you a nice little website. (laughs) That's it. Wow, it's it's incredible because you you're giving us so much value in those stories because it just you know the hunger and the desire to succeed just shines through all of that. And mm-hmm. you making it sound super easy of course. Um and you know it does take courage I think from you know, listening to what you've been doing to get started in, in all of that. It's, it's literally just courage and belief to, and, and not to give up, to keep going. And never say, this is my biggest lesson I had to overcome. Never say to the client that you know it. Hmm. It's something that was very, very valuable for me to learn. I figured this out naturally. So when they said, oh, you're so good at this, I said, oh, gosh, no. I get so frustrated because I'm trying to learn this, this, and this, and I can't do that. But I just keep at it. And like things would happen, of course. Let's say that you install a computer, but the internet just won't work. Mm. So now suddenly you have to learn about modems. Mm. Right. Mm. Because it's not what you install. It's the modem. Oh, God. And yeah. If you want to be an all around person. Now I had to go and learn about modems. Yes. So the only thing is to tell your client, we've come to a glitch. I do not know the glitch. Would you be willing to let me find out how we can fix the 
fix the glitch and I will not charge you in finding out how to fix the glitch. And what do you think the answer is? Yes. Go ahead, young lady. Yes. Because yes. you got their trust and um, all it took for me is my time. Now, if you look at today's life, people don't like that because they say, yeah, but time is money. And I said, I always say, but I get so much back for investing two and a half hours with a company figuring it out than by just going, oh, no, no, time is money. I don't do that. Right? Yes. So that's my lesson. My lesson I learned really quickly is to say, I am so sorry, Mr. So-and-so. I'm stuck. May I take your entire laptop home? You know, if it was a laptop, I would take it home and I would say, I'm going to fix this. Give me 24 hours. Give me 48 hours, you know, and then, you know, it, it's just like that, how I did it Yeah. until, until I did everything that I could. And, and that's basically how I've done everything. And, and all of that passion and, and courage that you've had building up in with all of these different projects where has that culminated today what where has that got you today and what what is it that you're most passionate about today for me um the passion for children has stayed and where where my entire life got me today surprised me Uh, apparently didn't surprise other people but All of a sudden, I wrote that book. My mom died. So I do have to be honest about that. My mom died Mm. in 2007, uh, almost 11 years ago. And it made me realize when I stood at her grave that I was an orphan again. Because, you know, having her, even though we weren't the best of buddies, I had a family member that was there, Mm. you know, even if I live in different countries, she was there. She was my mom and the only mom I've known. And so it kind of threw me off that she was gone. It really, it really did. I, I, I never thought that would affect me, Sure, but it, it really, really did. Losing a mom was, was just very new. (laughs) Very new. Yeah. And, and not, not because I had regrets, because people, your listeners might think that. No, I had straightened out everything with my mom. I don't have loose ends to tie up with people. I don't live my life like that. So yeah. that wasn't it. Uh, my conversations with her on a monthly basis were good on the phone. She was encouraging to me, and she thought I was a crazy, kooky entrepreneur. <laughs> she did. <laughs> And um, then I wrote a book because remember the seed for my life story. So I wrote the book. The book got a lot of traction. And out of the book grew that I did school assemblies. And I started getting money again for being a speaker. But instead of being on stage for technology, I was suddenly on stage for my own story. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that people would pay money to hear my dumb story (laughs) in my mind. Right. Because everybody thinks the same. Oh, my story is not important. That's right. What, what value can you get out of my story? Mm. But then And here I have to pause. It is a host of a TV show that gave me that courage. She read my book. See, many TV hosts, Michael, don't read your book because they can't. Let's be honest. They Mm. can't read everyone's book. They they just read a one-page review. The questions are already written out. And that's it. Yes. And this lady read the book loved it. And it's kind of scary to be a first author because 
you don't really feel an author just because you wrote one book. Sure. So I, I, you know, when people ask, could I speak to the author? I was actually hesitant because it's like, oh, heck, that's me, right? <laughs> um, that's so odd, right? And then people start saying, oh, I feel I know you, and that's even odder. <laughs> I don't know. That's not an English word, odder. But no. you know what I mean. <laughs> stranger, stranger. <laughs> I, make, I make it up, the words as I go. And so in any case, this woman says to me, Gabriella, there are beautiful gems in your book. And I said, are there? And she said, and you gave me the privilege to laugh and cry. Mm. And I went, privilege? Yes. You pulled me into your life for a moment. And in that moment, I learned things. I learned the emotions. I learned my own emotions. Um, I went back to my parents and told them I loved them. Uh, which I don't do enough. Your book taught me that. I think you should teach this, these gems to people. So then I asked someone, what are the gems? Because I didn't see them, Michael. I, I you know, I wrote my book, but I didn't read it. Do, do you understand the difference? Totally. I mean, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I was kind of stuck. So here, this woman gave me an enormous belief in my capacity of writing. And she said, it's only till I met you that I realized what you did. And then I said, what did I do? And she said, you are so frank in that book and so honest in your own mistakes that it's refreshing. Hmm. So why don't you do that and do that on stage, Gabriella? And I went, hmm, another new business. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was, you think I could do that? And then someone um, uh, said, and by this time I'm divorced for a second time. So, but I'm divorced very amicably. So I call up my ex and I said, do you think I can do that? And he said, of course you can do that. You already do that. And I said, are you serious? When? And he said, don't you remember in Holland, you started, you wrote cultural seminars. And you know what, Michael? I had totally forgotten. Wow. He said, you wrote the content, you did it, and it was a huge success. And you think I helped you as an assistant, and you think I did it. No, Gabriela, you did it. I was just the psychologist that kind of helped you feel secure, but that's baloney. And so I went and I said, do you think that the book is good? And he said, listen, Gabriela, I know your life story. I'm your husband or your ex. And I'm telling you, you made me laugh and cry too. So go out there and do it. So I did. <laughs> and I never wrote the talk. I, I never wrote it down. I just went. Yes. Because if I'm too scripted, I cannot do it. Because there's, you take spontaneity out of, you know, there is a little prep, just like I had for my Windows course, but you can't be so prepped that you become rigid. And so I decided that I knew the intro kind of what I wanted to go and what I wanted the audience to take away, mm. but that's it. Mm. And no slides, no nothing, just me for 45 minutes. Then you realize that 45 minutes is a long time. <laughs> yep. And, um, but, uh, I got my first standing ovation at my second talk a standing ovation by children. Mm -hmm. So a thousand children stood up and stamped their feet, stamped them in the bleachers. Like you have bleachers like in America, right? The, and, and so it makes an incredible noise. And it scared me to tell you the truth. 
And I stepped back on that stage. If I could have disappeared between the curtains, I would have. Mm. And so the children gave me the encouragement. And I said, wow, they got it. I, a high school dropout, not certain that I have any insight to teach anybody. They got it. And if there's just one child in that audience that has been helped, I am the luckiest person in the world and I'll go and do it. Yeah. And then I was even more lucky because I got an even bigger gift. And when it was all done and all the children file out with the teachers, and this is all new to me, right? I mean, I've never, you know, no, I mean, I don't know America or Canada that well, you know, and my school days are long gone. So I, I just watch in mesmerized, right? Sure. Shyly on the side, I watch. And then, you know, my spontaneity comes back because I see that there are a few children looking at me shyly. So I take a few steps forward and shake their hand, you know, I just, and then they started hugging me and, I'm like, oh my gosh, yay, this is fun. <laughs> and then they they push a Sharpie in my hand and I go, what you want with that? And I said, do you want me to write my next book with a Sharpie? And they go, no, silly goose, sign my autograph, sign mm -hmm. your autograph. And I'm like, why would I do such a silly thing? And they go, oh, duh, you're the author. And I go, oh, that's true. <laughs> and I start signing all these. I sign sweaters and I sign sneakers and I signed hands. And oh, my God. And I am shorter than most of the students. So it's really hard to find me <laughs> among <laughs> the. But someone took a picture of that and it's really, really, it was fabulous. Yeah. And not for the accolades. It was more fabulous because what the children said. <clears throat> and I, by this time I have a second book uh, for children and educators. So I give my second book to uh, every school I visit. And most of the schools I do, I do them pro bono because I am so saddened that if we don't help children change their behavior towards each other, then suicides will ultimately continue. And in America, school shootings will ultimately continue too. Yes. And I could not stand idly by and hear in the news that a seven-year-old child committed suicide. That is mind boggling to me. Yeah. I, I cried the whole evening that I heard that. And I have to tell you why, because I tried attempted suicide twice in my life. And so as a teenager, and I just decided that that pain that I had felt at 15 can't haunt children today. It just can't. And so I suddenly, you know, I've always been told that my name is the Archangel Gabriel. And I just, you know, dusted myself and my tears off and said, I'm going to help. I don't know how. I have no idea what this looks like. I don't know what I'm capable of, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. And to tell you the truth, that was an uphill battle because Catholic schools don't want to invite you because it's a sin to, to commit suicide and to die that way. Yeah. And I, of course, don't think it's a sin. I think the sin is that we let it happen. And so you can imagine that the Catholic Church, when I said that, wasn't very happy with me. And so I learned that if I was going to help children, I need to realize to put my frankness aside and help children and not be this stubborn, crazy woman that says, hey, this is not a sin. Everyone has a right to believe that. And so I came from another angle 
dropped the whole suicide thing and said, okay, I come from one thing and one thing alone. I made a basketball, had it printed, started bouncing it even in the Catholic schools. And on the ball, it says, we as a society have dropped the ball on human kindness. Will you help me pick it up? And then I throw it into the audience. What do you think happens? They pick it up Mm. because it's playful. Sometimes the teacher catches it, sometimes a child catches it, and then it goes from hand to hand because they read what it says. And uh, the, the ball is red, white, and blue, which to me is the Dutch flag, the yes. American flag, the French flag, but it's also life. White is for peace, for me. You know, red is passion, and blue represents the human beings then, little aliens. You know, we're just all weird little creatures and we have to learn to live together. Yes. It's that simple. Yeah. And I took every single thing that I have ever experienced, wrote the experience down, and out of that, I created what I do today. So whether I cried in my bedroom because I wanted a family and I wanted to belong, I took that pain, turned it into my greatest strength, which in turn makes me the cause's best ally. And that's what I do. I I don't really want to put a title to that, but that's what I do. So I I write articles for the, I used to write articles for the Huffington Post, but now they canceled that. We're not allowed to anymore unless you're a journalist. I write articles for whoever will take them about these little things, these little stories that connect us, that give little wisdom so that someone else, when they read them say, I'm not as alone now. I, I, I feel kinship towards a stranger because they have the same problem I do. Sure. And, and out of that and the documentary that I created for, um, suicides with, which is called our silence is complicity. And you can find a trailer on YouTube on that. All of that combined, I just take it and I go out uh, and I teach kindness in corporates under the, um, um, how do you say that? Under the umbrella of communication. Because if you say, oh, I'm going to teach you kindness, nobody is really going to hire you. (laughs) <laughs> because they say, okay, let's send this little girl to an ashram in India, shall we? Um, she must be displaced, right? Yes. And um, so then I realized that they weren't going to have it with kindness. They, everyone thinks kindness is a weakness. So I had to learn to be really creative, find my niche, and say, Kindness is communication. Mm. And without communication, we have nothing. And then people went, huh? And I said, uh, communication is also vulnerability. When we choke, that moment that we choke, that's where the true story is. And that's where the true healing comes. And if I choke with you in an interview on my story, whether it's, you know, having no more money and not knowing how to feed my family and finding that niche. Even if I choke on that, someone that listens to that says, holy moly, you know, I got $10 and I don't know how to do it. I have an idea now. Even if it's just that, then then the choking will have been worth it. And so I come from that principle. Communication is kindness. Kindness is vulnerability. Because without me showing my vulnerability to you, Michael, I don't learn either. It's, it's, it's both of us. It's all of us together somehow, you know. It's not like, oh... Whoa, you know, you have pain and oh my gosh, no, we understand the, the, the current within the pain. We all understand. Unfortunately, we all understand that 
it's what we have in common with each other. Totally. And and to finish that little phrase you started about mm-hmm. um what was it did you start off kindness as communication communication is kindness which way around was yep. it i said communication is kindness and kindness is vulnerability it, kindness is vulnerability so now i'm going to add to that and vulnerability yes. and vulnerability is power yes Love it. You just finished it off beautifully, Michael. Yes, yes, yes. I, If I could, I would jump up and down, but that's not going to help your audio <laughs> here. <laughs> it is. And and this is what I have. And, and people ask me, are you like a Mother Teresa now? And I go, oh, my gosh, no. I'm full of mischief, and I'm this crazy, kooky person that you think I am. Everything is right. And do I get mad? Of course I do. Do I get triggered? Of course I do. But I always try to do it with that doses of humor and kindness. Because the moment I get mad, I actually, the moment I see it happening, I stop and I start laughing. And I go, silly, huh? I get all worked up for nothing. Mm. Because... What I teach takes over, right? Because you have to live by example. You have to set the example. And so I show people how easy it is to actually let go of your own anger because you just get frustrated because your communication wasn't clear that they don't understand you. So I've got to be clearer. Yeah. That's all I do. And now I have this kind of beautiful title that was given to me in the United States. And I kind of humbly laugh at it, but inside there's a big, big smile of six foot long. (laughs) They call me the kindness expert. Hmm. And I think it's the best diploma I've ever received in my life. Yay. Because you know what? If the hard knocks of life, get you a title like that, then everything I do is worth it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because if entrepreneurship is that and helping people, then, you know, I always say something too. knowledge is power too, but to give knowledge freely to me is what life is about. Yeah. And I rest my case with that because everything is said, you know, how can you not help someone? How can you not? Yeah, I I just don't know. I don't know even how to, I I get a lot of flack in, 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 by my friends and by my own team that I'm too kind. And I don't know what that means, Michael. I actually don't really understand it. I, I I understand where they're coming from. I totally understand it, but actually they're not getting it. <laughs> so yeah. th- they're not getting it yet. And they may get it in this lifetime or they may not. That mm-hmm. is part of their journey. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's up to them to realize that this is who you are, right? This is this is the the beautiful package that you are. That's you know, there is the six foot kindness coming out of you that people have to, you know, pay attention to. And they need to find their own see if 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 people give you flack this is where this is interesting or people make comments and say oh you're too this you're too kind about these situations or whatever then in some respect you could say you gabriella um may have failed right and by the way, there's no such thing as failure, mm-hmm. but which isn't true, right? 
Because going back to the earlier conversation that we were having about people's filters and their life experiences, so they're judging the world through their spectacles, their, whether it's dark or rose-coloured, um, and they're making judgments about people and situations and places and events and experiences without, let's call it a kindness filter on it. Mm -hmm. And I just added um, a story to your website today because yeah. I was looking at your – just preparing for our podcast. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife and I went away last week to a health spa, and I'll just do a very shortened version. And that mm -hmm. is because I really appreciate the amount of time you've invested already. And I'm very, very grateful to you. That's very, very kind indeed. And And – there was one gentleman serving and his name was Armand and on his badge. And he was the most delightful server. He was serving coffees. People were going, oh, I'm sitting there. Are you going to be able to find me? He said, just go and sit. I'll find you. He was smiling and laughing. Nothing was a problem. People came with problems. He solved them. And... I saw my wife and I were watching him and we said, this guy stands out. He just is a ray of light in this room. And I walked over to him and shook his hand and I went, you are doing such an amazing job. Thank you. And he just blushed and waved his hand as if to say, no, 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 I'm not. And he got a bit tearful as well. He mm -hmm. was overcome by the compliment. And... But it doesn't take anything, you know, to notice something, to witness and actually go with your conviction and be kind to somebody for no good reason even. You know, I wasn't expecting anything from him. I just wanted to give that recognition to him because he deserved it. Mm -hmm. And he maybe nobody will give him that. His boss won't. Uh, his boss won't even notice perhaps. Some of his colleagues won't even notice, but we did notice. But the beauty of what you just said, the way I hear it, is not only did you see it, but you were present. And I, I say this with a big emphasis on the word present. Mm. Most of us are not present. No. We're in our heads. We're in the technology that's in the palm of our hands. And we're, we're incapable of seeing the world around us. Like in a museum, I'll just give you the example of a museum. They're behind the phone taking pictures. They're actually not seeing. In a concert, they're behind a phone. I take two pictures and that's it. And I put my phone away. Because A, they're not very well taken from so far. Yes. And B, I actually want to experience it. And I always give this analogy. When you look at that beautiful eclipse that we had on the 27th, my phone cannot capture what my eyes see. Correct. On the phone, it just looks like a little light blob, blob, blurb, I don't know what to call it. It's a blob, really, yes. right? Yes. But my eyes saw something totally different. It was awesome. It was mm. gorgeous. Mm. And that was being present. And so I commend you for being present with your wife because it's through that that you could give him the kindness and the compliment that made him tear up. And I think we tear up because we're so not used to compliments. We're so used to, yeah, how, how do you say that? Um, shrugging it off because I'm just doing my job. Yes. Right? Yes. But, but he was going beyond the call of duty, correct? Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you saw. That's the beauty of what you saw. Mm. Mm hmm. So I, I love that you shared that story. So thank you. I will, I will go look and comment because, <laughs> but what I hope your story does is that people say, yeah, gosh. So that compliment made his day. And so I have just spread it happiness around me. Right. Yes. And it was so easy. So easy. It took, five seconds. 
Yeah. That's why you must like my slogan. One moment, one person, one kindness, be the difference. Yeah. It's that easy. Yeah. And and it, it can be a hand on someone's shoulder. It can be, you know, anything. It it but it has I, I just want to make really sure for your listeners, it cannot be about money. I had a Malaysian um people that came over uh, from Malaysia to, to Los Angeles, America. And they were very surprised at something that I did. They, for example, give money to homeless, but they don't go into a conversation to just give the money and think they've done their duty to help. Correct. And I give food, not money. See, my philosophy is that we're here to help one another through. So the only way I can help is by giving food um, because that keeps them alive, hopefully long enough for them to maybe go to a shelter Mm -hmm. or want to help themselves. And then, but they were surprised because I, I have a conversation with them (laughs) and they never bothered to do that. Mm -hmm. And I said, but it's in the conversation that the beauty occurs for both myself and him. Correct. Correct. And yeah. And and you you probably don't know this about me, but I volunteer for a homeless charity here in the UK. And and (laughs) I have always, even before I started volunteering for them for years, I've always stopped and ask them, I said, right, what's the deal? What's going on? Why are you here? You know, how are you, what do you need to achieve today? Rather than going, you know, and of course, there are always people that are abusing it, but you won't know if they are unless you start having a conversation. If they don't want to engage with you, it's not real. Um, If it's a real person, then they will. And there was, just one little story. And I, I I never, ever tell my stories about my conversations with the homeless because it's a private conversation I've had with somebody. But there's one guy, he would came up from the south of the country and he was in this town called Birmingham. And I had a conversation with him and, and he told me where he, what, what he needed to achieve that evening. And I said, okay, so if you collected this money this evening, you're going to get a bed for the night and a shower and a meal. He went, yes. I said, so if I give you, it was only a small amount of money that he needed to collect, but if everybody just gives a penny, it's going to take a long time. So I said, if I give you that money right now, you're going to pack your stuff up and go straight there. He went, absolutely. I went, okay, here you are. And I watched him pack up, get his stuff and walk away. And he stopped begging. And he was going, he couldn't believe that I would do it you know, do something like that because he'd never experienced it before. But, and that's not to show that I'm that great, but it shows that if you have a conversation with somebody, you can truly help them Mm -hmm. with something they need in that moment just for that night. You know, you can't change their life. You can't give them a small fortune or anything like that. Um, And most people that give money they say, oh, I don't know what he's going to use the money for. They're maybe going to use it for alcohol or drugs. I said, good, so what? If it's his habit or her habit, they need to sustain that in order to stay alive, then that's mm-hmm. okay in that moment. So don't feel guilty that the money is going to be used in the wrong way. If you were only able to do that, that is enough for now, right? But next time you see them, do something different. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I agree with you. We, we, we can't talk. Unfortunately, we can't talk about the stories that we hear because if we could, oh my gosh, I would write a book about it. Um, Because I think if people heard half of the stories that, and I've never volunteered in a homeless shelter, but I've lived in Vancouver and I live in LA. And as you know, Mm. these are big cities Yes, and Um, The only thing I can say, uh, a little bit like you, is um, 
the homeless man got to know me because he always sat outside of the grocery store and exactly on the place where I walked in. And I walked to the grocery store because I lived very close. So I wasn't going through a garage where I can't see the homeless, right? Mm. Um, that makes a difference too. And so I just wanted wanted you to see that picture. So mm. I just walk in with my little empty bag and I see him and I said, hi. And he, the first time he was really grumpy and um, I got him a hot coffee with everything that goes with it and a muffin. And I walk back out because it was morning, right? And I give it to him and he kind of scowled and wanted to kind of, you know, drop the coffee. So I put it gently on the floor and he said, I just want money. And I said, I'm so sorry, I don't have any. And he said, well, you went in that store. And I said, well, we live in a world of plastic. I really don't have one dime of cash on me. And um, so he thought I was annoying. Mm. But then when I left, he started eating the muffin. I did see that. And a few days later, same scenario. But this time I buy something else. And he goes to me, oh, there you have that grocery lady again. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, this happened like four times. And by the fourth time, he's much nicer to me yes. because I let him break the ice. I didn't break the ice. I, I let him feel more comfortable with me. And by the fourth time, I sat on the ground with him and I said, you're my favorite bum. So tell me what you up to. Mm. And he thought I was nuts. And I said, don't worry. If you think I'm nuts, everyone does. So let's, let's, you know, let that go. What do you do? And so he told me and, you know, the truth is, Michael, his life is no different than mine no. that I just told you. It's no different than yours. It's no different from the listener. But somewhere, I, I, I'm so sorry, in, in America and Canada, you're one pay, I'm one paycheck away from being homeless and one family member away from being an orphan. Yes. And all of us are. And so I tell this spontaneously to this sweet man. And he said, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. I said, you think we're all so lucky, but you know what? I, I can barely afford my rent in this big city. I really can't. And if it wasn't out of the goodness of the hearts of my friends sometimes, I wouldn't make it in the bad times. And he goes, gotcha. And I said, so I just like to be your friend, but you need to be communicative and honest. I did what you did honest with me Yeah. and tell me what you need because I don't know. How would I know? I only know what I need. Right. That's right. And then he looked at me and he said, that sounds selfish. And he said, but it's the truth. I only know what's inside of this little mind, body, spirit. And I, I, I can guess what you need, but it might be totally wrong. Yes. And, you know, and we, we struck, I mean, I took him in my car to a place where he could at least get a shower. Yes. Because I said to him, you feel, you know, I feel awful when I'm sick and I can't shower. So you feel good already with a shower. And then I brought him back to his little spot because he didn't want to lose it. Right. Yeah. But that's what he wanted. And over a period of time, I had a friend who did volunteer with the homeless. He actually helped him together with me and he got back on his feet. Brilliant. And so, um, all in all, I think it took more than a year, but this man got on his feet and I'm not saying it's me. No, I'm saying it's a combination of his own free will and being less discouraged. Yeah. A little glitter of hope happened. And I, I know that my friend really guided him, guided him to such a point that, uh, yeah, in faith and yeah, that, that he felt he believed in himself again without going into the details. But again, all we need to do is make someone feel human. 
And so I would like to say three words that I think might help with this is think of yourself. You don't want to go through life unnoticed, unwanted, and unloved. So now go back to Michael's moment, you know, that you just said you were at this spot, you got up, you walked over to that man in that one moment, you gave him a gift, a real gift, and you changed how he feels about himself. Now that's powerful. Mm. Gabriella, we, that's it. we have no, not enough More. time to talk about no. the things we need to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your love and your kindness. I'm really grateful and I know the listeners will be extremely grateful for everything you've shared. And I need to figure out how I'm going to do this podcast, whether I keep it as one or do I split it? I'll have a think about that one. Okay. But listen, how can people get in touch with you? Very easy. If you type hashtag dare to be kind, you will find the hashtag everywhere. Don't try to type my last name. Uh, my website is gabriella.global and the dare to be kind movement.com. And I'm always, the door is open. The phone is easy to get me. And you know, whatever is your issue or your problem Together with a listening ear, we will always find resources to help you. That's what we're about. I'm giving you, sending you a big virtual hug. Thank you. I'm setting the intention that one day it will be a physical hug and I'll yes. see you in person. Gabriella, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for your stories and your sharing your journey with us. Um, I absolutely loved hearing it and tot scenes thank you so much staying alive uk share your story 